Hello, I'm Christina, and I will be inter inter interviewing Cara Thompson. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good, yeah. how are you? I'm really good. So, um, you went to Manchester University for a ma master's degree in English literature. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever think of being a poet? To be honest, I didn't really realize it was an option when I was in college. I mean, when I was in university, it was one of those things where when you're doing English, you're often told your only path is to really to become like an English teacher yeah. um, and or like a journalist or mm -hmm. something like that, um, which, you know, both great. But the idea of actually doing a creative career for life mm -hmm. was really sort of never even offered. So, I mean, I always knew that I wanted to write, but I didn't know that I would ever be sort of doing what I do now, which yeah. is sort of performing, writing poetry, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, do you remember your first poem? Oh, God. <laughs> my first poem, I think my first poem would have been, I was doing like a youth project, like a youth leadership project. And um, we had to do presentations at the end of it for this sort of assessment. And um, I decided to do mine in the form of a poem. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I was just sort of like, that feels correct. And I just remember shaking so hard and like sweating so hard. And I actually asked the entire audience to close their eyes because I couldn't bear the idea of them looking at me. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it just goes to show that I never thought that this would be the trajectory I went down, but it, it definitely um, introduced me to something I didn't realize I had in my sort of wheelhouse. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you wasn't a poet, do you, what career do you think you'd be doing now? So for a long time, I thought I was going to go down the professor route. That was why I did a master's in the first place. Mm -hmm. I thought I'm just going to go bang, 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 PhD next. Like, it's going to be so chill. Um, it wasn't chill. It was very hard. Um, and I think taking that time out of study was really important for me to realise I just had more life to experience, more of the world to see. Um, and... It's not to say I, I don't necessarily see myself doing that now. I'm quite passionate about um, black sort of communities in academics mm -hmm. because we're very underrepresented at a professor yeah. level. I think there's only something like 40 black women professors in the UK, possibly less. Yeah. When I was studying, it was about 20. Um, so I kind of felt a responsibility to, to do that and sort of be a representative because often we don't see ourselves mm -hmm. in sort of academic spaces. Um, and it's one of the things that really kind of makes us feel considered when, when we go into these places um, so maybe down the line like some sort of creative writing post or some sort of sociological post but yeah. for now I just really want to focus on creative sort of outlets so yeah will you ever do like international tours I'd love to <laughs> just waiting for the offer to yeah. be honest I mean a lot of it is you kind of need to develop this um, portfolio I guess mm -hmm. and, and this trust with um, you know, whoever you're sort of working with and performing with, and I've still not released a collection of my own, for yeah. example, and so it's kind of hard for anyone to kind of take my work with them yeah. at the minute. Um, so that's a goal for me, I think, to start, and then hopefully international opportunities follow, yeah. Like, do you have any, like, countries or, like... I'd love to be in the Caribbean at some yeah. point. That's my heritage, mm -hmm. and I think even to just maybe do, like, a residency there or something like yeah. that spend some time just really getting in touch with my, my parents' culture, my mm -hmm. grandparents' culture. Um, I studied in Canada for a bit, and that was so much fun. I, I loved being there and sort of the community there. Yeah. I could see myself doing something there. I also really want to learn French, so <laughs> that would be a cool one to be in France for a bit. But yeah, yeah I'll take whatever I'm going to get, to be honest. Yeah. Um, did you have any situations where you experienced writer's block? Yeah. <laughs> like all the time to this day and it is a sort of it's like a muscle yeah. you kind of have to exercise it for it to kind of just sustain itself and it is often the hardest thing once you enter that writer's block to get out of it and for me the answer to that has been community so finding a creative community that keeps you inspired and keeps you engaged and sometimes the most inspiring thing you can do is just go to a poetry show because you see someone else doing their thing and killing yeah. it and you're like, oh my, like, you, you take something with you and um, it energizes you to write something yourself. So that's sort of how I've learned to tackle it, but it's not something I've got down to a science. I still sometimes go months at a time with nothing and the imposter syndrome comes in and you're like, oh my God, have I forgotten how to write now? Um, but you know, it's, it's just a wave that I think you ride as a creative at any point. It's just gonna be times where you haven't got anything and it's like, 
give yourself some grace or come back. Sort of How do you feel being on stage performing? It's an interesting one. I think when I started, it was actually my least favourite yeah. part of the process. I always thought, I used to strictly call myself a writer because I thought I'm, I'm not a performer. Like that's just not in me. Um, and it was through mentorship really that I kind of began to realise just how enjoyable the stage can be mm -hmm. and how much it can add to something that you write. So, you know, when you write something on a page, yeah. that's between them and the reader, mm -hmm. do you know I mean? the words and the reader. But when you are the performer, you kind of captain the words a little bit and you can really be very intentional in how those words land. Yeah. Um, and that for me has just been really fun to explore, like realizing how much you can impact your words with performance. So I like, I like being on stage, it's nice. Yeah. When you write your poems, what gives you inspiration? So I'd say my main sources of inspiration are my heritage. Yeah. Um, so I come from a Jamaican background and within Jamaican background there's a lot of oral storytelling mm -hmm. and there's a lot of gross stories and a lot of just like generational stories and those have been just a huge source of inspiration like I'd say my favorite writers are just sort of like my elders mm -hmm. and and they've given me just they just have such a whimsical like way of writing and approaching life and speaking about life that it was almost bound to get into the writing yeah um Aside from that, it's in terms of like inspirations, Toni Morrison's a big one. Um, a lot of sort of black femme writers, I would say, who kind of unashamedly sort of relate to their experience and everything mm -hmm. like that have been a huge source of inspiration for me, yeah. yeah. Um, what is your favorite poem? It can be a poem that you wrote or it can be mm. a poem from someone else. It's a really hard question for me to answer because I find rather than necessarily digesting poetry on the page often, I love to be at a show. Mm -hmm. um, I just find something about that really magical between the poet and the performer in the audience. Um, fave of mine is probably Island Screams still, which is the one I entered into Slammervision, um, just because I feel like it's the first time I really found my voice and my poetry. And it's, poems often age after a while, you're like, oh, this is really, cringe or whatever but I still feel really proud of that poem to this day and sort of what it represents um I'll go with that yeah speaking of Slammer Vision mm. uh can you just give us like a, a recap of what happened so Slammer Vision is a global competition yeah. um run by UNESCO cities of literature so around the world I think there's something like 46 cities that have been nominated by UNESCO to be recognised for their literary heritage. Mm -hmm. Nottingham is one of them, which is pretty cool. Um, and because I was part of a poetry collective called Gobs, they put out this opportunity. And um, I had it in mind to do it, but I was sort of like, eh, I'm not really feeling it, mm -hmm. you know. And it literally got to the day of the deadline. And I was at a poetry show, and Bridie Squires, who runs Gobs Collective, this amazing local poet, she just said to everyone, right, Slam Vision's at closer tonight, submit your poetry, just yeah. do it. And I think she messaged me personally as well and was like, why haven't you submitted your <laughs> poetry? And um, it was really just sort of like a why not thing. I didn't necessarily expect much to come out of it. And I just got my phone. My room was a mess. So I just threw some blankets over like a chair and sat in front of it and put a, a light on and just recorded this poem. And I think it was like the second take. And I was like, it's 11 o'clock, I'm going to bed, like send it through. And um, I just really had no expectation that I would get chosen to represent Nottingham at all. It was just sort of like a, there's nothing to lose sort of thing. So getting that email back was very shocking. <laughs> um, and then obviously um, you go through to this whole process of it being this global competition and, and your videos submitted and shared. And again, sort of being at the live show, I remember I think Hindenburg were one of the entries and I was so sure they were gonna win. I just thought that, I didn't even fully understand their poem, but it was just like so powerful. Um, so, and it, it was very well shot and everything. And then mine was just like on an iPhone seven, like, um, so seeing those votes roll in was just like, I think I, I think I was at my auntie's house at the time. And we were both sat there just in shock, <laughs> like just in disbelief. Um, and yeah, finding out I'd won was amazing, but a, a real surprise, yeah. What did you like you achieve after winning? 
I think the biggest thing that came for me was just a sense of uh, confidence. I think for a long time, like I mentioned, performance had felt like something that was just my weak point, sort of my Achilles heel and my, my creative process. I was like, I've never had any stage experience. I'm just kind of doing it the way that I think is right. And to kind of get that, not that you need validation from others, but sometimes just getting that external nod to be like, you're, you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. It was, it just gave me something and I've held on to that ever since sort of thing. And that's been really powerful for me just navigating any spaces, I can kind of say, well, actually, like, I am a performer mm -hmm. and I owe it to myself to, you know, go out there and, and do my best and stuff. And um, it's also just a cool thing to say. Yeah. Like, it's just a really cool thing to be <laughs> able to say um, and to sort of enter into spaces and also just kind of hold for the city as well. Like the fact we've had this title two years running because um, Abbe, Abbe Odin, went after me um, and she's a babe anyway. So to be able to like hold that for two years and be able to like Nottingham is the center of spoken word poetry mm -hmm. and like recognized as such is like such a cool thing. Yeah. October, it's Black History Month for the it UK. Is. Um, do you have any upcoming events for Black History Month or have you yeah. previously <laughs> did any for this week? So yeah, October is always a, a wild time. I often find my calendar is beyond belief at that point mm -hmm. and it's an interesting one. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about that all the time because I think, you know, Black History Matters all year round. And yeah. I would love if there was an equal distribution of that in every month. But I also recognise it's really special to have a month where we really zone our energies into it. So that's a whole other debate. I'm not going to get into that. But um, yeah, October's busy. Um, I'm actually doing something this weekend at the canal side. Um, so I'm going to be doing a Black History Month event there. Where I'm doing some poetry for that. And um, I love that event because it kind of gives people, um, our community gets to engage with sort of the canals and with nature and with relaxation. Yeah. And I think that's something we don't always get, mm -hmm. we're not always exposed to. And to sort of have that open to us for like a full day is, is quite special. Um, I'm also doing a celebration of life event um, for my mom. My mom passed away in, Oct in June of this year. And um, she was a huge um, activist. She was a huge member of this community. And so we're just kind of throwing a big old party to recognize her at the Albert Hall. Um, aside from that, just milling about really. Um, so there's a few other things that are sort of in the pipeline, but just sort of being set. Some conversations with the universities. So obviously I'm here with you guys. Yeah. Um, so it's just, I'm trying to find that balance between sort of rest and my capacity, which I think is really important, especially for our community in this month. I think we deserve rest and we deserve recuperation, but also trying to make that time to share knowledge and honour my ancestors and um, connect. And I think that's the point of Black History Month, really. So, You was recently on a podcast where I belong, mm. where you produced your poem the legend of the river mama mm. when you first heard the folk tale how did you feel what was your reaction it was it was this feeling of connection i think um so i think i, I referenced it in the podcast but for me um one of my biggest inspirations was a lady called mrs a uh, she was an incredible community elder she lived into her 90s and she, i think she was the first one of the first black nurses in the country um but she's also just like this incredible storyteller. And she kind of, for me, gave me this real interest in folk tales. And she would tell me sort of these ghost stories she used to tell as a child in, in the countryside. And so that kind of led me to sort of look into my own sort of stories and find out what else was out there. And I kind of stumbled on this river mama tale. And it was just so cool. It was just like, this is so wild. And it was, it was also, I think just the fact that this kind of emerged from sort of the stories of the enslaved community and everything um, and those dynamics, um, the history was really interesting to me and how it links all the way back to West African folk tales. Um, so it was just a really rich story to me and really interesting to see what kind of characters emerge from Jamaican storytelling. They're often quite they're quite ominous, but they often have a purpose. Like they're not just out to get you for no reason. They're out, they're out to get you for some sort of revenge or out to get you for some sort of slight. 
And I was just really interested in the river mummer's slight, like what what's her driver and how do I connect to that as a Jama like a woman of Jamaican heritage. What was your favorite folktale that was taught to you? Ooh. There was one that Mrs. A told, I'm not I won't be able to remember it word for word, but she talked about um there being it's it's pretty creepy. There was um if there's like a full moon or something, there's a ghost that sort of lies on the ground. And um, I think you're meant to like walk backwards or something if you see it. It was, it was something like that. But it was just so funny because she's like this Christian lady. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's not the sort of thing you expect to, like a, a Christian woman to be talking about, but she'd like talk about it with such glee and like excitement. Um, I think there's another one, I think it's called like Roman calf or something like that. And it's sort of like a man with a bull's head or a body and, um, he sort of like rattles around with chains and everything. And again, that obviously links back to slavery as well. Um, but there's just such like a rich um, tapestry um, of folk tales, again, that sort of link back to like the Anansi tales of West Africa and stuff. And it's something that I just want to delve into more in my own writing as well. I just think there's so much to work with. You've told us that you are Jamaican heritage. Mm -hmm. I'm also part Jamaican. Nice. Um, what is your favorite memory of Jam like your Jamaican heritage? So my favorite memory of my Jamaican heritage, so interesting for me, I've never actually had the opportunity to go back to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. um, my dad came here when he was 11. Um, my mum was born here, two Jamaican parents, and um, he's never been back either, you know? Um, I think it's a, something that happens to a lot of Jamaicans once they get here, whether it's financial, or there's just the memories are quite hard to go back. Um, but for me, I kind of grew up surrounded by the Jamaican community. Um, I think for me, it would be like meals, like yeah. big meal times. Yes. So big occasions where, whether it's like a Christmas dinner mm -hmm. or just a Sunday, a random Sunday dinner yeah. where they just go all out for no reason. Mm -hmm. Like it's just Sunday. You don't yeah. need to be cooking three different types of meat. But at the same time, just having so many people gathered around the table and talking and sharing stories was sort of like my favorite element of being like a part of this community for sure. How did your mum influence your writing? Ooh, good one. Um, so my mum was actually, she didn't talk about it a lot, but she was quite a good writer herself. I think her, she was really great with sort of like a memoir style. So sort of just recounting her story or recounting the story of others. And um, towards the end of her life, she was actually attending creative writing sessions quite regularly. And some of the stuff she wrote was just so incredible. I'd, I'd love to sort of dig some of it up and share it and stuff. Um, but I think my mum's influence just came from her passion to um, fight for and illuminate the stories and lives of um, the African Caribbean community. And she did that through specifically supporting people through um, their cancer journeys. So whether you were, whether you had cancer yourself, whether you were impacted by cancer, she was one of the first black radiographers in the country. And um, one of the first to actually highlight um, inequalities and how sort of African Caribbean people with cancer are being treated. So she is, is essentially responsible for the fact that um, black people are called in earlier to be tested because we are more likely to be diagnosed earlier. She advocated for the diversification of food and hospital menus. So, you know, we can have something familiar when we go to hospital. Um, she just recently posthumously won an award for um, a black hair project um, where a lot of black women were going to get wigs and stuff and there were none that suited them. They were getting handed blonde straight wigs, obviously hugely unsettling experience for someone that's just lost their hair. Yeah. Um, so she identified a need and she, to the very end, up until 24 hours before she passed, was fighting for that need. And for me, that has just sort of infused my poetry in the sense that I see my poetry as an activist practice. Um, I see it as um, capturing stories, honouring stories, um, talking on issues that need to be spoken about. And I kind of take that quite seriously with whatever I write. Um, and that's just me, you know, poetry is, is whatever it is to, to anybody. But for me, it's, it's impossible to separate it from that heritage. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there any poems mm. inspired about your mum? Yeah, I've sort of, I really love to write poems about sort of um, maternal lines. Yeah. Um, so my mum was one of eight and seven of them were girls. 
Um, and then her mum had sisters and, and just her mum, I think, was like a midwife. And there's just so many fascinating female characters in um, my both sides. I think I had a, uh, like a priestess of like a spiritual sort of tribe on my dad's side. Um, and it's like, how can they not be in my poems and how can they not be a focus for me? Um, so it's just all the stories I've been told about them as well that sort of infused my poetry and still direct it to this day. And I think a lot about how, I think a lot about how things are passed down and whether that's traumas that are passed down, whether that's talents that are passed down, um, they are sort of kind of a real focal point in my poetry. Everyone has a different meaning to poetry. What's yours? Oh, God, what a question. Um, funny enough, I did, I did a workshop on this a while ago called um, Poetry Is, and it was really interesting. People come up with all sorts of things. They're like, it's this, the smell of fresh earth, or like, you know, very abstract things. Um, I think for me, poetry is connection. Um, I think I've just seen how incredible a bridge it can be between experience, especially with something like Slammer Vision, where I was talking, my poem spoke very specifically about this black British Caribbean experience that I did not expect somebody in Melbourne or in Quebec yeah. or in Germany or Albania to connect with, but they still did. Mm -hmm. And that for me, gave me so much more trust in people, um, in their ability to hold my stories and to hear me. Mm. And I don't think it's something that is necessarily as easily achieved through just conversation. Do you know what I mean? I think there's something about poetry that is so personal and so emotional and that taps into something so communal um, that you can't help but connect with somebody when they're that vulnerable with you. Um, so I think it's a mixture of vulnerability and connection. Now, what's your advice for aspiring poets or even people that want to get into poetry? I think just start. Um, and whether that's just starting in the privacy of your own bedroom, um, just getting the words onto the page mm -hmm. um, and also seeking out community. I think for me, my poetry journey really began when I found my poetry collective when I found other writers with other in similar interests and the networking that goes on with that, the friendships that come out of that have been so invaluable. And it feels like a whole other family that you open yourself up to. And because you're all doing this work, you all recognize how much vulnerability it takes. And so with that, there comes a care inherently. Um, so I'd say a mixture of just getting started and just sort of really trying to find that community that sort of speaks to you. Um, and just having, you know, utilizing the things that are available to you. So social media platforms are very powerful for sort of connecting with people, um, events that are going on in your city. If there's an open mic, give it a go. It's the perfect time to practice. You don't have to be perfect for an open mic. Um, so things like that, it's just, um, it's, it can be scary, but it's just, I think, if you just give it a go and see what happens. Like, that's that's what I'd say. Uh, before we finish, me and the team would like to dedicate this interview to your mom. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you, guys. That's really kind. 